Hello, welcome to The Future is Bright. I'm Stephanie Schaefer, your host, and I'm joined today by a very special guest, Emily Island. She's not only an adjunct professor at Cal State Northridge, but she is the author and creator of a program called Be Safe, which helps to educate our local law enforcement and our local community, including individuals who may have autism, on how to effectively interact in the event of an encounter with law enforcement. So Emily has created an entire curriculum, a 300-page curriculum, and has, in addition, written four books. She's more than capable of shedding some light on this very important topic, and I think today's show will be very interesting for a lot of us, including things like a silver alert, which some of us haven't heard of, um, kind of the counterpart to an amber alert, and also some things that we can do as uh, you know, parents and members of the community to try to keep our, our people safe when they do encounter law enforcement. So I'd like to introduce Emily. Emily, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Really excited to have you. And we're very excited to hear kind of what you've been working on with local law enforcement, how you've been training them, how you've been training the community at large. And, and really what the main risk factors are when there is an encounter with a person with autism and a law enforcement officer. Sure. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the program? What inspired you to write it mm -hmm. and to start teaching? Sure. Okay. So I am the mother of three children who are now adults. Okay. And Tom, Lisa, and Danny, and my oldest boy, Tom, has autism. He's now 31. And I didn't know anything about autism. Uh, I had to learn pretty fast. He was diagnosed late at 13. Okay. And uh, I learned to advocate for him and I learned to, I became a professional advocate after my friends said, will you help me? And then mm -hmm. strangers were calling and I needed to learn how to navigate the systems. And I, as this population is aging and children with autism are becoming adults, I became more and more aware of adult issues like okay. safety in the community, mm -hmm. which affects people of all ages. But the fact that people with autism are more likely to have a police encounter due, due to certain risk factors. On my own experience, knowing people who had police encounters, mm -hmm. and my bottom line is what do we do to make it go better when they happen or prevent them in the first place? Okay. And so if you're talking about the risk factors, what do you think, I've heard you say that people with autism are more likely, it doesn't matter how many times more likely, but definitely more likely to have an encounter, either as a suspect, a witness, a person of interest. Mm -hmm. What are the main risk factors as you see them for both law enforcement officers and for those persons with autism? Sure. Well, first of all, autism is an invisible disability. Okay. So when people with autism meet the police, the police don't know they have autism. Mm -hmm. They may, the police typically respond to behaviors that they see. And they typically think that most unusual behaviors are either due to drugs and alcohol or sure. mental illness. So our people, one of the greatest risk factors is being misinterpreted okay. as somebody who has drugs, alcohol, or mental illness when in fact they're displaying signs of autism. So okay. being an invisible disability, misinterpreted, mm -hmm. maybe can't communicate uh, in the situation with the police, okay. uh, can't, so they don't respond as expected and then that takes things to a, know, different level. a different level. Or they don't have the right social behaviors. Like they look disrespectful, defiant, disobedient. That facial expression. They look flat and they, they, they don't respond as expected. And then again, if they're, if they're perceived as defiant, that, that really you know, doesn't go down well with the police when actually they may have a processing delay okay. or they may not understand, hey, you can't get so close to the police. So all kinds of things uh, make them at risk when they're in a police encounter. Mm -hmm. They're at risk to get into a police encounter because of features of their disability. Sure. For example, they could be tricked by someone, yeah. set up to commit a crime, victimized. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there are these greater uh, risk factors. Well, I, there's so much information that we could talk about beyond just the initial teaching phase of this program, both from the law enforcement perspective and also from on the side of the community and our, our young people. But I feel like we could do a whole separate show about what happens in the event someone ends up in the criminal justice system or, God forbid, in jail for something that they really either didn't do or didn't understand their rights and so they ended up in a situation they may not have otherwise been in. What is the 
the law enforcement training section of this program? So I have a program called Experience Autism, okay. and it's experiential learning that gives law enforcement an idea of what it feels like to have autism. So okay. we do a simulation activity that gives empathy to the police. I feel that if they understand features of autism, they can come up with their own solutions. So for example, we do an activity where the police have to rephrase a sentence we give them like, I love dogs, and we tell them to say, I love dogs without using any words with the letter O. Okay. And what we get from them is a pause. I love dogs. I like canines. I like canines. Okay. So then they've experienced a language delay, a processing delay, and I said, look how long it t took you to answer my question. Mm -hmm. They're constantly asking people questions, and when they get the delay, what do they think of it? That you're under the influence of some type. So we say, if that's what it feels like to have just a tiny taste of a language processing problem in autism, how could you help that person? And then the police tell the solution. So we're not okay. telling them what to do. Okay. We give them understanding so that they know what to do. So in your experience in training these law enforcement officers, what have you heard in terms of those self-suggested fixes well, by police officers? They're the things we would want them to do anyway. They, okay. say, you know, they say, I could, I could wait. I could give them more time. I could mm -hmm. simplify the question. Mm -hmm. they, they have lots of tools in their toolbox already, but they don't know to apply it to this population until we give them that insight and perspective right. through the training. And I, I recently did it with the Burbank PD. We trained all 100 officers there, and one of our partner trainers was the father of a little girl with autism. Okay. And he said, this is amazing. You Great know, training. if you would just listen to what they're saying, this would help my daughter. This yeah. would help everybody's child. You know, it, it just it does give them really great insight, and they will do the right thing if they can. Okay. And you've trained what forty five hundred officers yes. already, mm -hmm. and and it's ongoing. Is yes. Right? Well, in I've been doing all different types of training programs since two thousand six when um, the I was. Uh, involved with the Autism Society of Los Angeles and LAPD came to us and said, will you help us? We need more information. And I began to develop content and curriculum and it evolved into experience autism. But you were also the past president of the Autism Society yes. here in Los Angeles, yes. isn't that correct? And that's why when they came to us, we were like, okay, we've got to say yep. yes. I don't know how we're going to make this happen. We're sure. going to say yes because we knew how important it was to train the police about autism so that they could recognize the signs and know how to respond appropriately. Now, in in addition to creating the Experience Autism program mm -hmm. for law enforcement, you also came up with a very detailed curriculum in both English and Spanish, right? Right. That's called Be Safe. Okay. And what happened was when I was training the police, they told me that it, it didn't matter if they knew someone had autism. If they did certain things, mm -hmm. it was not going to go well. And if, if you read the papers, you know what those four things are that'll get somebody in trouble. Well, why don't you tell us? Because right. I think people take it for <laughs> granted, but it's... it's Okay, so the, if, if you run from the police, they okay. have to chase you. Okay. It's not going to turn no out No matter well. who you are. No matter who you are. Even mm -hmm. if they know you have autism, if you run, they chase you. Okay. If you fight, they have to fight back and win. And win. And win. We don't want to know what that means. Right. So okay. the more you escalate it, the more they have to escalate sure. a fight. If you reach into your pocket waistband, they're going to assume you're reaching for a weapon if you have autism or not. Mm -hmm. And if you... Um, if you don't cooperate with them and follow instructions, they're going to have to step up their game as well. Mm -hmm. So what we want to teach people is what to do instead to avoid those problematic situations. Stay calm when you meet the police, okay. stay where you are, follow instructions, cooperate, and never reach into, for, anything. for anything or towards them. They don't like okay. to see you coming towards their gun, sure. their badge. So those are the four things. So I thought, well, how if those are the most important things for people to know, how do we teach that to our young people? Mm -hmm. It's not sufficient to, to just train the cops. We have to be training our young people. So I made Be Safe the Movie with Joy Travolta and the okay. Students at Inclusion Films. So in the film Be Safe the Movie, we use video modeling to show what to do when you meet yeah. the police. Okay. So it's all positive. Instead of saying don't run, we say stay, stay where calm. you are. Stay where you are. Instead of saying, don't panic, we say, stay calm. So we tell them and show them what to do using video modeling. So the movie Be Safe is available online if anyone wants to purchase it. Yes, it's at besafethemovie.com. Parents the movie. 
Okay, so you heard this. This is BeSafe.com. You can obtain the movie that Emily created, and parents can use this. Guys, you can use this with your kids to help them understand what to do and what not to do. As you said, mm -hmm. Emily, the four things that the can get you killed are, are a big deal for police officers, especially in today's society with uh, so many potential dangers for the police and their increase in the use of body cameras and car cameras. Everything's recorded, and we have to really elevate our our safety precautions, I think. Be because we can't blame the police when they have a justified use of force, and that's what the cameras are for. But what we want to do is prevent that escalation mm -hmm. and by training, and it's BeSafeTheMovie.com is where you can get the movie. And the way I designed it is first we have our lovely narrator, Tori Fritz, who happens to be the sister of a man with an uh, intellectual disability. Okay. So she explains the concepts and then we model what to do and then we come back and have an interview with the people in the scenario modeling. Uh, they explain why they did certain things and okay. what the expectations are. So I, I developed it to have a lot of uh, integration of uh, concepts and different ways of teaching the same information so we can reach a wide range of learners of all verbal and cognitive levels. Well, and our learners learn in different ways. Some mm -hmm. of us are more visual, some more verbal, and so I think this helps. We actually have a clip of exactly the point that you described about the importance of staying where you are and staying calm. I think it's the shopping cart Yes, clip. we call it the innocent mistake where a couple okay. of kids decide to take a shopping cart because it's a hot day and their backpacks are too heavy and the police pull up. Okay. And then we begin our scene. Okay, and that's something that could potentially happen. It's, it's There's very... lots of everyday scenarios, like where the police have sure. contact, but what happens next is the question, does it stay smooth and go calmly and well, or could it escalate? Well, and it all depends on what the police officers do versus what our youth decide to mm -hmm. do. So we have this clip for you. It's about a four minute clip. We're gonna show this. And parents, if you're out there and you have experienced something similar, maybe take a look and see how this be safe training and this scenario can really help our youth. And as well, are the police officers who are out there who maybe haven't gone through be safe training yet. This is a great tool for you too. Now, Let's look at a real life situation about an innocent mistake. Yeah, we Afternoon guys, what are your names? Jerry Marco. Monica Wilson. You guys wanna tell me where you got the shopping cart? Uh, we got it from the store parking lot. You do know it's against the law to take that, right? We wanna borrow it not keep it. Is that against the law? Well, the shopping cart belongs to the grocery store. If you take something that doesn't belong to you, it's the same as stealing. We're sorry. We didn't mean to steal it. I'll tell you what. I don't think you knew what you're doing was wrong, so we'll overlook it today. But I'm going to need you to take that right back where you got it, okay? Let's go ahead and get going. We're going to watch you. All right. Okay, thank you. Jerry and Monica handled the situation very well. They honestly didn't know that taking the shopping cart was stealing. The officers realized that this was an honest mistake and they let Jerry and Monica go without giving them a ticket or arresting them. Let's take a closer look at what happened. First of all, notice how Jerry and Monica stopped walking when they saw the police. They did not try to run away when the police car came near. It is extremely important that you never run from the police. If you run, the police will have to chase you. That is a situation you want to avoid. Next, notice how Jerry and Monica had a calm conversation with the police. Everyone was very polite. Jerry and Monica told the officers that they didn't know it was against the law to take the cart. They apologized for what they did wrong. They did not argue and they returned the cart. This is really what happens when kids are finding themselves in a situation where they're encountering a police officer and now, as a result of the Be Safe training, they do what? They know to stay where they are when they meet the police, stay calm, and follow all the instructions. Do what the police tell you to do. Exactly. We even refer to 
the just do it from the Nike. Sure. If the police tell you to do something, just do it. Yeah, don't ask questions. Right. And we need to teach that rule. I, you know, sometimes some people, people say to me, well, what if it's a rogue cop and they're telling yeah. them to do the wrong thing? I'm like, well, that's such an exception. What we really need to teach people is the rule. The mainstream. Do what the police tell you to do because it's going to okay. go a lot smoother if you do. Yes, and, and that's an, another piece of, of, of that scenario is after the scene where in our movie, uh, those were real young adults with disabilities talking to real police. So it was a very realistic Not series. simulated. That's Not a simulated. Real, that okay. was real. Okay. And, well, the scene was simulated, the scene, but, the, but people the people were real. real. Yeah. And the police did exactly what they normally do and say. That was not okay. scripted. Okay. They, that was their thing. So that was an organic yes. experience yes. for them. So then afterwards in the movie, in every uh, episode, we, we debrief it. We ask the police, why did you do this? Mm -hmm. Why did you say that? And we ask the young people, what were you thinking and feeling? Because we need to explore those perspectives because if we don't do that, then our young people can't generalize. Right. They would only know how to follow the instructions if it was about a shopping cart. Okay. But by exploring why the police do ask you to do certain things or how you suppress the feeling of panic and stay where you are because sure. you know you need to. We explore all that in, in the movie so that people can you know apply it to their lives. And in addition to the movie, don't you have actual community training where you bring people in who have autism and they have an opportunity to actually interact with police officers, get to know their local police officers? Yes. Okay. That's Tell called, us about that. That's called a Be Safe interactive screening. Okay. So, I, I, they're, they're hosted by community organizations and they bring me in. I travel all over the country doing this. I'd like to go to every state in the union okay. and do this. So we bring the police and the disability community together and it doesn't just have to be autism. It could be anyone with special learning needs. And we show scenes from the movie and then the police lead activities with the young people mm -hmm. out of the curriculum that I wrote that goes along with Be Safe. Okay. So for example, the young people get a chance to learn to ask for help. Okay. They learn about the police equipment and boundaries for not touching. Sure. Uh, they learn about laws they have to follow because that's a great way to stay out of trouble is follow the law. Exactly. And they get to try on handcuffs if they want to. Okay. And some people don't like that idea. They think, why should we be putting people with disabilities in handcuffs? But I believe that it's important that in a small, safe environment, someone would have the sensory experience of it during a calm, safe time rather than the first time they ever have those horrible things on them is when somebody's behind them, putting them on from behind. Right, that, which can be traumatic, but in particular for individuals with those sensory issues. Right. That's so, a more calming environment. It's a, so I like to give them the sensory experience and know that they can follow the procedure safely, mm -hmm. practice it safely, so that it ever happens and they are in a panic, their memory kicks in and, sure. oh, remember this happened before versus leaving it to chance, which I think is really dangerous. So what other scenarios do you show in the movie that you think are of particular importance mm -hmm. for well, youth? Well, one of the most important ones is called um, mistaken identity. And there's okay. this guy sitting waiting for a bus, minding his own business, but there was just a robbery nearby and the police think they found an armed robber sitting on this At a bench. Bus stop. Yes. Okay. So they treat him like an armed robber. They jump out of their car with their guns drawn, and he's like, what is going on? But he follows every command they give him. Mm -hmm. And we take it slow, so slowly, interlace your fingers, and put, you know, we model right. everything the police might say. Right. Sit down, cross your ankles. We show all these commands and how this boy follows them. And, and then the police realize they've made a mistake and let him go and apologize. And we have a clip of that, yeah, actually, we do. that we can show. Yes. So we'll show you the clip now of Mistaken Identity, which, we again, we highly recommend that you take a look at this. It's a great scenario for showing both how the police officer should react and and how what might actually happen if you were approached by a police officer. In fact, something like this just happened in New York to the tennis player, James Blake. And he was a victim of mistaken identity. And so it does happen more often than we think, and not just to people with uh, particular, you know, with people with ASD, or it could be anyone. It could be someone with Alzheimer's. It's very important to understand how to interact with our law enforcement in a safe manner. So here you go, mistaken identity. Hey, put your hands up. 
Drop your backpack, put your hands above your head. Interlace your fingers, put your hands on the back of your head. Stand up, move your left. Spread your legs. You got any weapons on you? No. Full ID on you? Back pocket. Where are you coming from, man? School, I'm trying to head home. What's this all about? Have a seat on the curb, I'll let you know. Keep your feet straight out, cross your ankles. We got a report of a robbery in the area. You match the description of the suspect we're looking for. Robbery? I didn't rob anybody, I'm just trying to head home. Okay, well right now all we got is the description, so let us do our job, figure this out, we'll get to the bottom of it. If it's not you, we'll have you on your way, all right? All right. Negative this one? Copy. All right, stand up, man. Back up on the curb. Okay. Apparently, you're not the person we're looking for, all right? We appreciate your cooperation. Unfortunately, you just happen to look like the wrong person today. It's all right. My partner here has got your ID. Okay. Appreciate your cooperation. Thank you. Back next year. Let's get out of here. This was a case of a mistaken identity. The police officers heard the description of the robber and needed to find someone who matched it. Vaughn matched the description of the robber. The police needed to investigate. Did you notice how the officers immediately had their guns out? They thought that they found the robber. They knew the robber had a gun. They had to have their own guns ready. Fortunately, there was no need for guns. What did the police do? First, they told Vaughn to stop. Officer Wells told Vaughn to put his hands up. Vaughn was told to interlace his fingers and put his hands on his head, which he did. Next, Officer Wells put handcuffs on Vaughn. He took one of Vaughn's hands at a time and put them behind his back. Then Officer Wells did a pat down to search for weapons. Officer Mears checked the backpack to see if Vaughn had the stolen money. Then he took Vaughn's ID to the police car. The police checked the ID to make sure that the person is not wanted for another crime. Even though the police had the wrong guy, Vaughn handled himself very well. He didn't run away when the police arrived. They told him to raise his hands and stand up. He followed their instructions. He also moved slowly so the police could see he was cooperating. So that was a clip on mistaken identity and all the things that could potentially happen, what do you think are the most important aspects of that clip? Well, uh, again, we're modeling what you should do because people get handcuffs on them for different reasons. They could be detained for different reasons, not just that they did something wrong. Just sure. like the clip shows, anybody, you could just be sitting waiting for the bus and the police think you did something wrong. Mm -hmm. If the boy in the scene had fought with the police, run from them, they already had their guns drawn. Okay. It was not going to go well. If he had reached into his bag, there were so many things he could have done wrong. We didn't show any of that because right. we know in the news what that looks like. Sure. We showed how those, how to follow those instructions. Okay. Uh, what did, you know? Some people wouldn't know what interlace your fingers even means or cross your ankles. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. So we show them all those things, but we also then discuss why did you do this? Why did you tell them to do that? And basically, the police need to control the situation while they're gathering information or for whatever reason. Sure. And um, if people know what to expect and can cooperate, it goes very much more smoothly. <laughs> yeah, well, we've seen situations where either family members or people themselves have failed to cooperate or have tried to intervene and help in the event of a, a person with ASD. And they're simply trying to say, hey, this person X, Y, Z, but the police are trying to do their job, which is to keep the public safe. And sometimes that requires a little bit of an investigatory phase. And so what do you think are the most important things that our youth and, and people in general can do when they encounter a police officer if they've been diagnosed with autism? Is there something, some tool that's available to yes. them? Yes. Number one is let the police know about your autism. If you have okay. autism, have a safe way of letting the police know. 
And you created something specifically for this purpose, I did. right? Yes. Um, I came up with the, the I Have Autism card okay. for drivers in particular. So this is something you could keep in your wallet, and then when the police ask you for your license or ID, mm -hmm. you also hand them the card. Okay. So that's the safest thing because the police have already asked you to produce something. They're expecting you to reach into a pocket or bag to get it, but you would just pull out two things instead of one. Right. We actually have a scene about this in Be Safe with a girl being pulled over by the police and handing over her, her autism card, but she's also wearing a medical alert bracelet on her left wrist Okay. because that's the, that's the hand that's on the wheel with right. facing the officer if you get pulled over and they're trained to look for medical alert tags. And they make you generally, when a police officer pulls you over, they ask you to put your hands, hands at 10 inches, hands on the wheel, please, so then it's then they identifiable it. and they can see and they will flip it over they and will. look. They will. So in, in the absence of, let's say, a medical ID bracelet, you've got this card, and I'm looking at a copy of this, it's, it's really quite ingenious. It says, I have autism, and on the back it says, how to help me, which uh, we're gonna throw up on the screen for you to see, but it talks about, Calming techniques help me keep my cool, uh, use a calm voice. Sometimes police officers can come off quite abrupt, especially standing on the side of a freeway, let's say. That's called command presence, and okay. it's part of their training. Okay. <laughs> Avoiding physical contact, if possible, to reduce flight or fight response. So The uh, panic mode that someone might go exactly, into. Exactly, which is also the benefit of having this training and allowing our youth to experience it in a safe and quiet environment before it actually, God forbid, happens. Uh, reducing input like noise and lights to calm my sentence and my senses. Sometimes if you're pulled over at night, the first thing a police officer will do is shine that light right in your face. A friend of mine who was driving who has autism, uh, the police were behind her and she was so freaked out by the lights in, in, the, uh, in her mirror and in her window that she pulled over in, in front of an oncoming car and got hit. Oh, goodness. She was so freaked out. So we asked, you know, reduce the noise, the number of people, the, the proximity, whatever you can do physically to make the environment more tolerable. Which is really great training for our police officers because if they're aware of this, they will share this with their, with their colleagues and then that spreads to whenever there is an incident where someone's pulled over or, or does it have to encounter law enforcement. Uh, be clear, use simple words, give one instruction at a time. That's a big one. It is, and it's hard for them to do. And in our, in our training, they come up with these solutions. These are the solutions that the police came up with in Experience Autism. Even more ingenious. So they, they came up with these ideas themselves, and they know why it works. And even if they haven't been trained, it's all spelled out for them here very okay. clearly. Okay. Also, wait, be patient. I need time to think and respond. That goes right back to the example that you gave about say I like dog I love dogs without using right. O. So I like puppies. Mm -hmm. These police officers have learned, I think, to be more patient mm -hmm. and to give people time to respond. Right. And if, if this is the first time the police officers even hearing about autism from this card, if they can it. do these things, it's right there. Well and if it's saying this is how you can help me, then uh, I think that you've already gotten yourself ten steps ahead of the game in terms of being safe and not having an environment that's potentially harmful. The police say, the more information I have, the better I can do my job. Okay. In an emergency, they don't, there's not a lot of time to explain, but to have something like this, uh, or any other tool that someone prefers mm -hmm. to use, if they don't want this one, they could use another tool. But uh, the more instantaneous information they can get with the least amount of language, sure, and especially for people who don't have a lot of language in the first place. Well, and for, for law enforcement, it's usually a, a situation of assess, collect that information quickly, and make a, a spur-of-the-moment decision that's yes. the most safe decision for whatever the environment calls for at the time and in, in order to keep everyone safe. Uh, the last item on here for how to help me is call someone who knows me and ask them to help. Is there a place on this card for on the police back officers? Side. Okay, on the so back side. on the back side, and I'm looking at this card, and we're going to put it up on the screen for you in a moment, but it says, emergency contacts. My name is, fill in your name. I need help in an emergency or criminal situation. Please get in touch with my emergency contact right away. And there are a couple of names and numbers and where you live. Yes. So that's very, very helpful. That already puts you so far ahead of the game. Yes, because, you know, it's really important for someone to be able to self-disclose and not rely on like a parent to arrive on scene sure. or a caregiver to arrive on scene. You know, that doesn't always go well. 
the police like to follow their protocols. Mm -hmm. If they ask for an ID and they get this extra information, they can it's incorporate it rather than having something disruptive. And where do people get these cards? If I'm a parent and I want some of these cards, how mm -hmm. do I get them? We have them at BeSafeTheMovie.com. We also okay. have them for Down syndrome and Alzheimer's. Okay, fabulous. Because we know people, the police, the, the tips are kind of similar. They they are. I, I've got one here in my hand called I Have Down Syndrome. So it, they both have emergency contacts on the back. And they both uh, have information on how to help me mm -hmm. with just very key points. And then on either side of them, the one that says I have Down syndrome makes a very uh, a good recommendation not to put the person face down so they don't suffocate. And for autism, it's all about communication, social skills, behavior, and sensory sensitivity, which can really help. Also, it says I may shut down or escalate when, stress, when stressed. That's important. That information is so much more than most of us could get out, most of us in general, and the, just whoever we are, when being pulled over by a police officer. We're not given enough time to say any of this. No. So this is instant safety and protection, I think, yes. at least. And we actually use this start. card in Be Safe the Movie, and, uh, and I have some realistic things that happened in real life. Like, for example, it's two police officers talking and reading this card together. Okay. And one knows about autism because his nephew has it, and the other doesn't know. And the one officer says, should this girl even be dry driving if she has autism? And the mm -hmm. other officer says, oh, yeah, people with autism can do all sorts of things. Oh, yeah. You know? But well, that's a good scenario because many times, if you notice, when now, especially these days, when police officers pull people over, they oftentimes have a second vehicle that will pull up. And yeah. so you, you find yourself with two, sometimes three officers for a simple traffic stop just because those officers happen to be in the neighborhood. I've asked police officers about this. That can be even more traumatic, I would think, to an individual with ASD because they're now in the presence of three police officers, when does that ever happen? Well, actually, the others usually stay back and only one goes to the window, typically. Now, is that the new training? That well, that's what I've seen. And okay. in fact, that's how it is in the movie. Uh, remember, in the movie, we didn't tell the police what to do. We just let them do what they do. Mm -hmm. And in our movie, one comes to the window, the other stands behind. Okay. And so... It can, it can be pretty intimidating if you find yourself sitting in the driver's seat of a vehicle. And this has happened to me before where you've got one police officer in your window and another one in your passenger window. Yes. And, and partially they're just looking for kind of the plain view doctrine, anything that's out and apparent in your car, anything mm -hmm. that gives them reasonable suspicion or probable cause to go further or to search the vehicle or search you. Yes. And so this card is great. Let's put it up on the screen if we can. This is the I Have Autism Emergency Contact card, which, as Emily said, is available at BeSafeTheMovie.com. Mm -hmm. And so you can buy these cards and really protect and Just yourself. one more tool, because the police need to know, and, and you, everything's so fast in police sure. work. Split-second decisions, needing to gather as much information as they can as quickly as they can. And, you know, if someone has a disadvantage in autism of their language going away when they're in a panic mm -hmm. or they, their verbal skills are limited anyway, we've got to give them tools for communicating effectively with the police and safely. Sure, absolutely. And what about um, from the standpoint of, and here I was going to show you the Be Safe the Movie, by the way. This is the movie that we're talking about. It's called Be Safe the Movie. It's available at BeSafeTheMovie.com. Yeah. It's got all kinds of in interesting information on the back. Uh, this is how to interact safely with the police. You can get this along with the curriculum. And you can also get this movie in Spanish. Well, the movie comes in, with Spanish subtitles. The curriculum yep. it also comes in Spanish. Yeah. Okay, so the there's, there's a, a host of opportunities here. Um, Spanish and also English and are you working on other languages did you say? No, or? I'm bilingual in Spanish and okay. I've been involved with the Latino community for many years so sure. I really wanted to just come out from the first day to have it all available in Spanish as well. And we know that safety crosses all cultural boundaries so it's important for everyone to be safe. What do you find now in having taught this program to several police officers and in dealing with the, the public and how to be safer are the hot topics of today. 
Well, one of them that I take a little heat on is in episode six, we teach the right to remain silent. Okay. And my view on teaching this is it's very difficult for someone with a disability to judge what to say and not say. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can protect your right to not self-incriminate is if you understand it. Sure. So we explicitly teach what it is and encourage people to ask for a lawyer. And the reason I tell people on the spectrum to ask for a lawyer is because then the lawyer can help them decide what to say or not say. Maybe they should do a confession. Who knows? But the lawyer knows. Sure. The person with autism is not going to know how to, uh, to protect their rights necessarily. So they need special um, instruction in the topic, and then they need a rule to follow. The rule is ask for a lawyer. And some police have argued with me that uh, you know they'd rather have the person confess. And I said, well, are you saying that a person with autism should have less rights than somebody else who has the right to remain silent? Right. Uh, there's a film by Dennis DeBot where they ask some people with autism, do you waive your rights? And they, they waive their right and hand. And there's the danger of the way not protecting yourself and then saying something that's potentially incriminating yes. and you've either not been Mirandized or you don't understand what the Miranda rights are. Right. It's another issue. Like for example, in the son, case of my son who's a very bright man on the spectrum, I asked him, what would you tell the police if they stopped you? And he said, I would tell them everything for the truth will set you free. And where did he get that from? From a movie. I, mean, I know it's a line in the Bible and um, you know, but he was going to live by that rule instead of really understanding what will happen if you just tell the truth to the police. Um, the police would like us all to always tell the truth, but we don't have to. We don't have to incriminate ourselves. So we need people with autism to either understand that they don't have to answer and they can ask for a lawyer or just to ask for a lawyer from the get-go because anything you say can and will be used against right, you. Right, and usually is, uh, and exactly. unfortunately. Uh, so is, if you had to summarize the easiest way, the easiest rule or most simplified rule for folks who have ASD, who find themselves in a situation where they're potentially saying something that is self-incriminating or an officer is trying to get them to confess to something and they don't have that capacity to understand, what is that simplistic rule that you would teach everyone? Give your name and stop talking. Give your name. Give your name Do you and ask, ask for, for a lawyer. lawyer. Okay. Now, I would argue with mm -hmm. you, just to play devil's advocate, that if I'm a police officer and I pull someone over and that person says, I want a lawyer, I'm automatically, it's just human instinct to assume they must have done something wrong. Right. I, I guess we would say if they're detained. If it gets okay. to the point of being detained, that's when you ask for a lawyer. And what, what would you teach our our youth that detained means? Right. How well, do they know when they've been detained? Well, we, we bring up a couple scenarios in the movie when someone is detained, but we can't teach every nuance, so we use sure. Be Safe to open the discussion, and then you would go from there okay. um, to, to find other resources, which we suggest other resources, and to go into the, that level of detail. We're kind of given the big picture, sure. and then we're, we're using it. That's why the curriculum is there, to have those additional pages to go into some topics in mm -hmm. more depth. Okay. Uh, to make sure that everyone has the 110 safety words in the vocabulary that they need That's to be safe. That's a lot safe. of words. It is a lot of words, and okay. we expect people to be safe when they don't know what self-incrimination means or they don't know what a law is. Mm -hmm. we, they don't know what um, danger means. How do we expect people to be safe if we're not teaching these things? Well, and you have the example of the gentleman sitting on the bench with the mistaken identity. He now finds himself detained, mm -hmm. when does he ask for a lawyer? Is it immediately, mm -hmm. hi, I'm so-and-so, and they know that this person is not the one they're looking for, ask for a lawyer, be quiet? Is that basically what you would recommend? Well, um, probably. In, in w the way we model it is he just waits quietly. He doesn't say anything. He says, what, why are you doing this? And they're like, we'll let you know. But he doesn't mm -hmm. talk. He just sits and waits quietly. And so there is no problem because he's not giving any information. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the part about being de detained is a, a bigger issue, and we have an episode about it. Okay. Uh, with also an, in the movie. Yes. That I would we, imagine that that is a very important thing for people to know, especially where you're trying to ascertain, uh, you know, have, is it just a basic traffic stop? Is this a situation where I'm potentially a suspect in a crime? And sometimes people don't even realize that they are when approached by an officer, and this goes for everyone. There's we, a 
big question about that. You know what's amazing about what you're saying is look how complicated this is and people aren't even teaching the first thing about it. Exactly. They're just hoping it'll go well when it all happens. If it happens, or they're hoping it won't happen. The same scenarios happen for people who don't have ASD. So to so it's it's far more complicated for people who do. And that's why I think these cards are such an amazing asset to have. A, I'm sure that this helps the police. Are you giving this out to law enforcement officers so that when they see them, it's not the first time they've ever seen it? We do give the police, when I do my experience autism training, we do give the police that, that the exact ace. information. Okay. Um, but you know what's interesting is people aren't taking responsibility for making this part of everybody's life skills instruction. Mm -hmm. Everybody with an IEP should have this in their educational plan and in fact I have 30 IEP goals written in the curriculum so it can be integrated into the teaching. How do we send someone out of high school or, or out of their high school program at age 21 or 22 without having without taught the these things? You know, so what is your solution for this? What's, well, your, I, what's your wish list on my, making sure this gets out there? My wish is that people would prioritize safety with the police for everybody and take advantage of these tools. I created them because they didn't exist and I knew how important they were and it was very important to have people with autism and other disabilities help make the film that gives it authenticity. Sure. It's peers, modeling for peers. Uh, but then we, I went, because I'm a college professor, uh, I also di made this differentiated curriculum that teachers can use, adult programs, behavioral therapists, speech and language pathologists, parents, everybody can use this to make sure that we're teaching these most important things. So basically, no matter the channel, you can get this, and I'm gonna pick this up because this is quite impressive. You can get this Be Safe curriculum, which like Emily was saying, is 300 pages, including those 110 vocabulary words of safety words, yeah. did you call them? that are available no matter your profession. There's a way that this can get out to people to help keep our youth safe and our law enforcement officers to do a better job. Exactly. So, And um, also, uh, the curriculum um, can be used by anybody, anywhere, at any time. It, it, you print out the pages you need from the CD-ROM. Sure. It, it's very user-friendly is what Emily is saying. and. It's pretty timeless in terms of just your basic, understanding your basic rights and, and understanding that basic interaction. And I did want to add that it, this is for everybody. We can't, we should not assume that this is too hard for some people to learn. Because if the way to fail is to assume that someone can't learn, because then mm -hmm. we don't try. I think everyone's capable of learning. And we've had some people who have watched the movie and then typed into their iPad what they learned from watching it. We have someone who is nonverbal who had been arrested three times and hadn't learned what he needed to know because every time he was arrested he ran, he fought, mm -hmm. and people would explain to him, you can't do that, that's dangerous, and he didn't learn it until he watched Be Safe the movie okay. and he wrote what he learned, he learned to stay where he is, stay calm, do what the police tell me to do, mm -hmm. don't touch their stuff. Right. He learned from watching Be Safe, what he couldn't learn in real life from real life experiences multiple times being arrested. Interesting. So it's a powerful teaching tool and we have to assume that everyone can learn. Well, I think that's a great place to take a break and kind of take a look at what else might be available that we can let people know about that might be an ancillary tool to the Be Safe program or to experience autism and maybe uh, let some folks know about some of the other websites that you mentioned sure. that are very helpful sure. and key. We'll be right back after this and we'll uh, finish up with Emily Island. I know a cute little blue eyed boy, and his name is Jack. Jack Riley. He got a big, warm, blue eyed soul that makes your heart beat fast. Yes, I, mean. I sing Jack, Jack, Jack is my buddy. Jack, Jack, Jack is my buddy. Everybody around is so down with Jack. So, Jack Riley, how old are you? Six. Are you in first grade? No, it's going to be first grade though. So what are you in now? 
because I'm zeroth grade. <laughs> what do you call zeroth grade? Kindergarten. The A word. I think that word was far worse than we ever expected. Yeah, I, re I remember I kicked the garbage can when we were outside. <laughs> My foot hurt. I remember that. And, uh, that wasn't a very good day. I guess it's, it's a pretty good example of what it could look like. Um, I mean, there's struggles for all kids. Um, but the fact that they were, um, Cheryl and Mike were so great, you know, um, taking in our parent training and utilizing the tools that we gave them and um, being on board with us and um, being consistent. I feel like consistency is so important because sometimes I know when parents come home, it's just easier for them to just give the child whatever it is that they need because they've had therapy all day. But the consistency, I feel, is so important. And that's, you know, how you get over, um, you know, their behaviors, their difficulties. Um, and yeah, so yeah, consistency is key. And it's obviously worked for them. Like that, okay? Ready? You can do it. One, two. Three. Yay! You did it, Jack! Good, Good job. job! Good job, Jack. We adore him, so whether you do the right thing because of that, you're doing something because of it. Um, I think I saw coincidentally, it. some of it's right. <laughs> when we first, you know, you hear autism, and of course, I did all the online research to scare you to pieces, and, you know, one, one of the things that probably hit me the hardest was that he's not supposed to be a kid who likes affection. He's not supposed to be a kid who, who's going to put out affection. And of course that's not true, but you know, what did we know at the time? So I think then, um, and it's in both of our nature that we thought we could love it out of him. Um, which is probably one of the best things that we ever did. Maybe, maybe, I don't um, know. Um, uh, I'm going to marry somebody. Yeah. Eloise. Eloise? You've got a lot of contenders, though, for who you might yes, marry. Yes, I do. Who else might you marry? Uh, she's the only one I'm going to marry. Oh, yeah? I hope. Um, and as I said many years ago, I want him to date. I think that's a, that forms you. Um, it forms your... It informs everything in your life. Uh, you know, getting your heart broken, breaking a heart. Uh, confidence, insecurity everything's informed by dating and um, I really wanted to do that and to me that's a typical behavior. Just that I, I don't know I mean he's just such a cool kid it's just I, we are amazed every day at some of the stuff that he says and does and um, and feel very I guess honored privileged to be his parents. Well, what if mommy asks you to eat broccoli what will you do? I would eat it but I don't like it. Okay. It just tastes like because I don't like eating trees, and it, that looks like a tree. That's true. You don't like eating trees? It looks like a small tree, like this big tree. Yeah. That's one thing that autism has done for us. If I, I just don't know that if you don't go through this, that, that you, I mean, I was never someone who lived in the present very well. I, I tend to look to the future a lot always planning what's next, what's next, and boy, he, he helps me to live in the present because you just have to. You have to appreciate every little thing. A part of me wants me him to forget that he ever even had therapy, just to grow up and make memories, make friends, and um, yeah, be successful in life. Perfect, now I'll pull the other one you. You did it. sentence. A lot of joy and uh, growth and uh, 
when you when you find the fun, um, it's probably bigger than it ever would have been with, with a typical kid because you work so hard for it. And uh, that's about it, I think. Can you take this off? Yeah, <laughs> Makeup. Temperamental star. Nailed it. Welcome back to The Future is Bright. We're back with Emily Island, who's been telling us about the Be Safe program and all the things that we can do for our law enforcement and our local community to help have better interactions and safer interactions going forward. But what we didn't get a chance to talk about are that there are these other new programs that will help, and in addition to the little card that we were showing people, the emergency card, that there are types of QR identification codes and mm -hmm. things that people can wear. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Well, um, some friends of mine in Santa Clarita started a nonprofit called If I Need Help, okay. and they're using QR code IDs to, uh, to put on people's clothes for people who can't tolerate medical jewelry sure. in particular. They have patches, shoe tags, uh, other types of things, that dog tags. And people can scan this ID with a smartphone and up pops whatever information the parent or caregiver wants to appear. Mm -hmm. So if someone's at Disneyland and they get lost and you scan the QR code, it says, please bring them to security booth number three. Okay. Please bring John and talk about Star Wars while you're coming over here. Right. You know, or please call this cell phone number. Personalized ways it's to get them home safely. Right. But you're not telling their name or their diagnosis or anything like that. You're you're customizing sure. the message. If the person goes missing, um, you can they have a, a form you fill out that's all ready to go and if they go missing you can okay. you know get all hands on deck. You no, know, it sounds like very new technology and I know that QR codes have really only come into sort of pop culture in the last maybe five years or so. Yes. What do you do in terms of teaching law enforcement officers and safety officers at places like amusement parks and so forth to recognize a QR code ID? Well, um, you know, if I Need Help is only one of the organizations doing it, but their patch says, if I need help, and then the QR code. There's no formal training. national training, and there's no consistency, and there's lots of people using QR codes all over the country independently of one another, but seeing yeah. it as a possible solution. But um, it's becoming more popular, it sounds like. It is, like. and they've had some success stories already, like uh, somebody at a soccer field, a child, a child with autism got lost, and somebody saw them, saw the If I Need Help patch, sure. scanned, it, scanned it, and had the parent's cell phone number like that so they could so, call and say, I have them. For those people who may not know, if I'm wearing a, a QR code and I, it says I need help or if I'm found, what do you do as, let's say, Johnny Civilian out there? Well, if you know what a QR code is... Some and you, people don't. It's these little, it's a square that looks like it's made out of black and white uh, dots or okay. pixels. Okay. And you're, you have a smartphone app mm -hmm. that's called a QR code reader, and you just put that code you read the code with your smartphone and it connects to something. So like okay. it, where I live, they have them at the bus stop and you can find out when the next bus is coming by right. scanning the QR code. There's all sorts of uses for them. Okay. And this one is to communicate live to help somebody before the police even need to get involved. So that's what So that could be communicating with family members or whoever you've designated in that QR yes. information. Okay, so you've heard it from Emily. It's basically you just Take your smartphone, hold your camera or your QR code app, which basically looks like you're about to take a picture. It puts it in between the bars. It'll line up the QR code, and you can scan that and help an individual get back to safety or back to their family. And you said there's something else. Uh, I think you said the Take Me Home program. Mm -hmm. So it's there's an officer in Florida named Jimmy Donahue who has a son with autism, and he f thought it would be really helpful if police could have like a registry of knowing who the vulnerable citizens were, that if they ever got in trouble, they're in the registry, they could, um, the police could help them better because they would have okay. that information. So he offers that software for free to any law enforcement agency in the country. It's called 
Take Me Home. And I know that here in California, San Diego is using it. Okay. And, and it Successfully? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. yes, successfully. Okay, well that's another program then that should probably be spread and more widely used. And part of the problem with a program like that is getting people to know about it and enroll. So we have yeah. registries at different places, but people aren't putting themselves in in a voluntary way. They think, oh, I don't want people knowing that information about me. Well, what I've learned from working with the police is it can take them one to two hours to gather that same information during an emergency or they could have it at their fingertips ready to go. So that information, if people are interested, would be available at www.takemehomeprogram.com? I think they could just Google Take Me Home. Okay, so if you need to know about this or you're interested at all, there's also the QR code ID. You can find all of this available on the internet and we'll try and put the same information and Emily's program as well up on the Autism Society website so we can centralize it and make it accessible for you. Emily, it's been such a great pleasure speaking with you. It's, it's a great program. You've given us some really helpful information today. Thank you so much for joining oh, us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I really hope that we can work together to improve outcomes and prevent something bad from happening. It sounds like we already are. So thank you, thank you again. It's, it's been an honor. And we're going to take a short break and then come back and hear about the big give that's happening next Thursday, the 17th. We'll be right back. What is autism? 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 Uh, <laughs> I've been asking myself that for a very, very long time. Um, let me think about that one. <laughs> trying to, uh, just, uh... Jeez, let me think. <laughs> oh man, that's a tough one. Yes. Uh, autism, uh... Autism is a neurological disorder that affects many of our kids in different ways. It's a learning disability that affects the cognitive functions of the brain. A lot of people have the misconception that it's a disability and it's really not. I look at it as like a special gift. When one person thinks differently from another. It's an opportunity for everyone to learn to understand someone that's a little different than them. Autism is the ability to educate. They're given so much talent in different areas. To me, autism means a chance to be with and be around people you really care about. Autism is beautiful. It's a way of seeing the world differently. It's always unique, totally intelligent, and sometimes mysterious. Happiness that, that, that comes out of my um, son's um, hard work. It's a movement. Unpredictable. That's right. Awesome. Love. The field I want to work in. Laughter. Fun. Joy. Autism is beautiful to me. I want you to remember these three words. There is hope. Hi everybody, we're back with The Future is Bright and we have another special guest with us, Michael Lever, Director of Development for the Autism Society of America. Hi Michael, how you doing? Great stuff, how are you? Great, thanks for joining us. We're here to uh, question you and probe you about the Big Give, which we all know is happening on September 17 and we're super excited about that. Can you tell our audience about what the Big Give is, what its purpose is, and how they can get involved? Sure, uh, so the Big Give is um, our first annual uh, national fundraiser for the Autism Society. Uh, it's a social media driven uh, fundraiser that's happen happening all across the country. And the way to get involved is to go to www.autismbiggive.org and uh, you can sign up uh, to get reminders between now and the 17th or you can just go to the website which is again www.autismbiggive.org on the 17th, which is Thursday, uh, to make a donation. And uh, we're encouraging everyone who's interested in supporting us or your local affiliate or any one of our partners, which you can find on that website, um, to, to go ahead and do that. And we're really trying to put a face to autism, a positive face to autism, um, and show that we're united and that we're supporting those who are on the spectrum and and being really uh, supportive and, 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 and being, um, uh, like I said, a positive as opposed to negative face to, to what to the spectrum. Um, the other thing you can do is support us by going on social media and promoting it. And you can do that by uh, posting uh, how you're involved or how you're affected by autism and using the hashtag uh, pound sign autism big give. Uh, those are the two ways we encourage everyone who is capable of giving to make a donation. And if you're not, by simply uh, 
supporting us by spreading the word. That's fantastic. So you can use hashtag uh, autism big give if you want to tweet it out or do anything to spread the word. Um, it sounds like a really great event. As Michael said, we're trying to raise money to help uh, support fun, you know, create funds for the community and to provide those much needed resources across the United States. Also, if you want to donate, unless I misunderstood Michael, you can go right to autismbiggive.org. You can find right. out more information about it and make donations. Is that right, Michael? That is absolutely it's right. It's just as simple as that. We can't wait for this event. It's going to be a really big success. And up until the event, you can also use that website to make donations and to help get involved. And you can also use the hashtag uh, autismbiggive up through the 17th and uh, spread the word. So thank you, Michael, for joining us. We're, we're really looking forward to it, and we hope it's a tremendous success. Thanks so much, Steph. Thanks, Michael. Take care. See you. We're going, to, we're going to do cat pose. So just like cow pose, we're going to be on all fours. So knees on the mat and then hips over knees. And then you're going to put your headlights or your hands on the floor, right, on your mat with your fingertips facing the front of the mat, okay? And so for cat, what we're going to do though is you're going to look, your, your gaze is going to be towards your belly button. So your back is going to, going to arch like a, a scared cat or a mean cat that's trying to scare someone off. Arch it up. Yep, arch, scare those, scare those enemies away. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> so you've heard about the big give. Please uh, get the word out, hashtag big G autism big give. And if you are interested in making a donation, www.autismbiggive.com. Thank you for joining us today. We will be back again next month with a new episode of The Future is Bright.